from Acts 24:16, the conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. And he writes, God's commands are given to the life of his son in us, consequently to the human nature in which his son has been formed. That is altogether a novel statement. Never thought about that, never considered about the, the life of his son in us. The command is given to him who resides in us, maybe because we ourselves would not be able either to rightly perceive God's command and requirements or to obey them. But the, the, it's spoken to the son. The life of the son in us is a wholly fresh way of understanding this relatedness with God. The reason I'm so intrigued with this is that I'm so caught up now over the issue of law and having a rabbi who is the finest expression, not some schlock guy who takes a stab at it, but I mean a consistent, practiced, fully devoted life of obeying the law as he understands it, that is given commandments, and 613 of them, that you have the knots on your talus to remind you that there are 613, plus who knows the infinite number of varieties of interpretation and uh, additional applications that have come through rabbinical renderings. So what's the alternative to living a life that is set about with a hedge of so many compliances and laws? He asked me if I had kept the law during the Passover season. In other words, did I eat matzah? Did I cease from leavened bread? So I had to admit I essentially failed. I took a stab at it. I said, you know, I came to realize that I had to live in a believing community of a law-keeping kind in order to fulfill that. Living by myself in isolation and meeting with people and friends through the course of those days who are not observant, you necessarily are going to fail. They're not going to require you and you eat out with them and when they bring something to the house, one thing or another. I said, it made me realize that in order to obey the law, the law as a basis for life requires to be in the midst of an observing community, which is indeed how he lives. His whole community has been constructed by an orthodox builder, and the former model home is now the synagogue, so that when I was with him on my first visit, he disappeared at about 7.38 in the morning. Where did he go? He walked to that house, which is the synagogue. And he's there three times a day when he's home. And of course, on the Shabbat, you don't drive to the synagogue. That would be a violation. You walk and you have access. So I'm being introduced to serious Judaism and men who are very serious and uh, don't feel themselves to be in any bondage in obedience to the law, look upon it even as privilege. And yet we know that God has brought us into it and invites us to another dimension beyond regulations and even the commands which he has given, Paul speaks of it in another way, as instruction, as our teacher to bring us into um, Christ. So, this is this, I'm reading this in that uh, coming out of that context. His commands are difficult, but immediately we obey; they become divinely easy. Conscience is the faculty in me which is which attaches itself to the highest I know and tells me what the highest I know demands that I do. It is the eye of the soul which, which looks out either towards God or toward what it regards as the highest, and therefore conscience records differently in different people. If I'm in the habit of steadily facing myself with God, my conscience will always introduce God's perfect law and indicate what I should do. So here is, in one statement, an alternative to the observance of orthodox rabbinical practice that is based on relationship that has to do with steadily facing myself with God. I would say that my rabbi would, would not, wouldn't even think in these terms because this suggests that there's a possible relationship of such immediacy and consciousness of God in a personal and intimate way that it affects your conscience and the way you determine what needs to be done and what's good and what is right uh, or to be avoided. He would call this phantasmal. This is make-believe. What we have is concrete, clear, and enjoys the sanction of the sages through many generations. This sounds like copping out 
and assuming a kind of relationship. But of course, we know that uh, Oswald Chambers is not a cop out. So if I'm in the habit of steadily facing myself with God, my conscience will always introduce God's perfect law and indicate what I should do. That means that that law is variable and um, it's not fixed. I mean, of course, there are fixed commandments, but there are details of life, what do they call them? Uh, like expedient, not expediencies, uh, exigencies, excuse the language, but you English majors, of course, will know it. <laughs> An exigency is just the unexpected, untoward thing that comes up that requires a decision or response where well, you've not been that way heretofore. Mm -hmm. You've never been faced with quite a situation like this that requires some kind of response or obedience, but you can't consult some book of law to find the answer for this particular situation. So those who are here in the morning, I think this morning's prayer time, we even prayed that such a crisis would come to our rabbi, mm -hmm. that he would be faced with a new kind of situation of a kind in which uh, the code of law and his knowledge of it, which is extensive, being a fifth generation Talmudic scholar, cannot provide an answer. He himself has got to give the answer in the predicament or the crisis of the moment, out either of his knowledge of God or the sense inwardly of what is right, but it's not based on what is stipulated, but on what is inward. We need to know these things. I mean, we're, we're, we're coming to a historic clash, almost of kingdoms, more than that. It's a clash of cosmic ways of perceiving reality and righteousness and how to act and conduct oneself in life. So um, we need to have a, a sense of what, that, what is represented in their Judaism at its best and what it is to which we ourselves are called. And maybe uh, the Jewish community has not had any challenge to it because how many Oswald Chambers have they met? How many occasions have they had to, fight, to see men and women who know God in such a way and face Him steadily and constantly that whatever the situation, however unexpected, there's an inward spirit ability to give an answer in a way that would be pleasing to God and satisfy the requirement of that law. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in fact, it's so great that it led me to the path of salvation. It was that very episode in the first reading of the Gospel of John as an unbelieving atheist aboard the deck of a tramp steamer, as you know, some of you, on my way from Italy to Greece, that I was reading the New Testament and reading that very episode. And when Jesus was caught in that predicament of crisis, in which by every reckoning he said he came to fulfill the law, not to destroy it, the law says that by stoning to a woman caught in the act. And yet something in your inner man cries out for something beyond the penalty of the law. But what could the man say? He's caught by his own words. He's come to fulfill, not to destroy. And he, I, he bent over the earth. I had my finger in the book. I was afraid to read on. <laughs> my heart was pounding. The sweat was oozing out of the palm of my hand. This terrible predicament. What would I do if I were faced with it? And as a fact, I was faced with it. Because I'm caught in the act with that woman. For the first time in reading of her dilemma, I see my own. That what we modern men have dismissed as poetry and love and the once in, uh, with the thing that comes along in a moment of time that you have to seize, the fact that you're married, or you know, that's a secondary thing. I was an adulterer, and I deserved the penalty for the first time I'm recognizing it. So what issues from Jesus at that moment is not just academic, it's life or death. And I'm breaking my brain to think, what can the man say? After having said he's come to fulfill and not to destroy. And then finally, with a sigh of, desperation, exasperation, there is no human answer. I opened the book again. Jesus bent over the dirt. These men, I can just understand their frenzy and their fury at what he represented because he's challenging a whole mode of being by law that says this is the penalty for someone caught dead in the act. And if you're righteous, you'll stand for that penalty. What are you going to say now? We got you, hot shot. You who you, you give off vibes that threaten us and our system. And then he looks up and he speaks that, uh, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. <laughs> Where did that come from? That was so holy, so beyond human conceiving, that the men who heard that turned away. 
was it from the oldest to the youngest, uh, they all st were convicted on the spot, and one by one they all left, and the woman is left utterly alone. Where are your accusers? They've gone. But what, he, what was being worked there is exactly what Oswald Chambers is describing. Because Jesus himself had this relationship with the Father, because he steadily faced the Father, because he moved from the thing that was inward and not external, the Father was able to quicken and answer beyond human wisdom itself. And that's the alternative to living by prescriptions and stipulated code of law. So the point is, well, when this is indicated, will I obey? I have to make an effort to keep my conscience so sensitive that I walk without offense. I should be living in such perfect sympathy with God's Son that in every circumstance, the spirit of my mind is renewed, and I make out at once what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And that's where I got zapped this morning. I, I knew that it was somewhere in Romans, and I found it, and I read over, and we can do it now, Romans 12, 2, because it seems to be at the heart of this posture so just beginning, you know, 9 to 11, of course, is the great statement, the mystery of Israel and the church. And then the first two verses that follow, at a time when there were no chapter designations before the convenience, and it's just one continuum, unbroken continuum of Paul. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. I'm reading today and, and looking up different commentaries that what is, you may have it in your own edition, the word reasonable is really better translated rational. Reason, not any meaning mine anymore, I, I, I can consider this reasonably, in the light of the mercies that have come, that have affected your salvation, this is the rational way that you ought to be responding. <laughs> to make your body a living sacrifice because it's Jesus making his body a living sacrifice that is the mercy of God toward you so having received that now you extend and express that out of gratitude for his mercy extend mercy and through your body because we don't live uh, in a glass house in some phantasmal spirituality but in the practicality of the grit of life with people on the earth that requires a bodily expression of your inward virtue, your morality. This is a moral situation, moral statement. And be not conformed to this world. Here comes the punchline. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Whew, you guys have to help in this. From what I, I'm gathering from that reading is that for us to determine in any given moment, and our life is the, mo is the sum of all of our moments, and our moments are going to become increasingly weighty and significant and ponderous and full of consequence one way or the other as we move to the end of the age, that in any given moment we have to prove or test or evaluate sense, discern, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? So what a, what a remarkable uh, premium this puts on the life of the believer. That Judaism is, is a conformity with an accepted um, history and code of law, regulation, and requirement. And you become a student to learn what each of those stipulations are how they have been understood, how they have been uh, discussed by rabbis, how they have given their present applications. You learn it in order to do it. The great emphasis is on study. And when I went into the yeshiva with this rabbi, I saw 3,000 men. They were not kids waiting to graduate. Two-thirds of them were unmarried. And I said, well, how long is the program? He says, there's no stipulated length. Study is a lifetime's preoccupation. Well, how do you get your degree? There are no degrees. They're, we're not, they're not going to school to receive a credential. They're going to school to learn Torah, to learn the law. 
in all of its ramification and its application, and it's a lifelong undertaking. The great emphasis is learning and knowledge and mastery and obedience, doing that. We, we need to know this is the most... Jews may be few in number, but that system of what they are about and what they represent, how shall I say it, is one of the most ponderous realities that exist in the world. And though there are only a small number of Jews who are that observant, other Jews are affected by that uh, complying minority, and then even it goes out into the world like resonances, like waves. It affects things, even to those who are not even religiously oriented. So there's something going on that is so foundational to to Judaism and, has, and is so fraught with meaning that it behooves us to understand it because our last day's um, conflict with this people will have to do with th these issues. Either meeting Jews who actually subscribe to this and do it or Jews who are not as observant but look to the rabbis as being the source of understanding and wisdom. And if our rabbis have not seen your Christ and the truth of it, then we don't even have to bother ourselves to examine those issues. I don't have a word for what, what I'm sensing in the inner man of the magnitude of what is represented in what we call Judaism versus Christianity. In two mindsets, two modes of apprehending life and reality and determining how to live life morally, which is to say how to live. And that's what life is all about. And so they look upon us, can you imagine, with such disrespect, because historically, what has been performed in the name of Christianity, and especially as it has affected Jews, in no way gives any evidence that it can even compete with the high moral ground of law-observant Jews. And our antinomianism, our, our anti-law mentality, in the name of grace, it shows us to be so slovenly, so slack, that our most renowned uh, ministers fall into the, into the vilest forms of sin and, and treat it lightly and feel pressed if they're required to, to cease their ministries for three months as if the world can, uh, can't do without their performance. So they see this and they know this. And so we, what can we say? Like systems in collision. And so, all of that rests on this verse. Be not conformed to the world. So I'm asking, how do you discern in any given moment what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God? If you're not functioning according to that which is stipulated, established as a code of law, and you have got to act in good conscience before God in any moment, how do you discern in that moment what is the good and acceptable will? Paul is suggesting that it has to do with not, not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind. So, evidently, if we're slack in being transformed, and we're... Uh, settling into a certain mode of being and being conformed rather than transformed, we will not have the faculty to discern or to evaluate or to sense what is the good and present perfect mind of the Lord. This is a remarkable statement of requirement. You can't um, employ something that was the mind of the Lord last week over a comparable situation and apply it here as if that would be appropriate. That might have been the mind of the Lord in that moment and under that given situation, but what is it in this moment? There's a certain immediacy that is in keeping with Oswald Chambers about keeping your heart, uh, God steadily fa facing steadily toward God. 